Our next, our final sub, uh, subject for the um, conference will be a subject near and dear to my heart, uh, uh, pregnancy hypertension. And uh, our presenter will be Dr. Michael Belfort. He was born in Durban, South Africa. He received his medical degree at, um, this is Whit Watersrand Medical School in, Johanna, in jo Johannesburg, South Africa. Um, he moved to the United States in the, about 1989. Uh, he, um, prior to that though, he, he went to um, medical school in, uh, at the uh, University of, <laughs> it's hard to pronounce, Whit Watersrand Medical School in uh, jo Johannesburg, South Africa. Uh, he, it, following this, he uh, completed an OBGYN residency program at Baylor in Houston. Uh, he, following this, he completed fellowship training in maternal fetal medicine at, at Baylor. And uh, currently, he's the director for the HCA Corporation, perinatal research director. And he's a professor of the Department of OBGYN at the University of Utah. Um, it's a great pleasure to have Dr. Belford. Good afternoon. It's always a pleasure to be the last speaker of the day. Everybody wants to go home, sitting there hoping to get your CME certificate, so I'll try and be as quick and painless as possible. What I'd like to talk about is hypertensive disease and with a specific focus on standard of care. And it's always difficult to, to talk to people with a focus on medical legal liability, but I think it's, it's probably something that is rational and logical these days. And given that there are a number of ways that people practice medicine and everybody believes they're practicing within standard of care, what I would like to point out as we go through this talk um, is the bottom line standard of care. And that, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists basically puts out guidelines of which more are sent these days or purchased by lawyers' offices than they are by obstetricians, which is of great concern. And so frequently you will find uh, obstetricians being questioned under oath in deposition or trial by lawyers who are more knowledgeable about the standards of care than the physician is. And that is of great concern. So I'm going to try and present uh, different approaches um, but underline and underpin everything with standard of care here. And I will present some research data as well to show you uh, some of the rationale behind what we do. Okay, so uh, let's see. Next slide. So some of the top uh, questions that are being asked uh, in a legal situation, failure to anticipate, and that's an interesting one. Doctor, why didn't you anticipate that this patient was going to get hypertension? How come you didn't realize she was going to have a seizure? Why didn't you take uh, prophylactic action when it was so obvious to even a lay person as myself that this patient was going to have a seizure and a brain bleed? Failure to treat hypertension, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Prevent seizures, adequately treat seizures. The delay in delivery, failure to give informed consent. This is a very big issue these days, especially when you are delaying delivery to allow a very preterm baby to gain maturity. It is an informed consent discussion. And I'm currently involved in a case where a doctor and a hospital system are being sued because they did not allow expectant management. Not because they delivered the baby too late, but because they are now accused of delivering the baby too early. And the, the, the mother is saying, you should have left my baby and you should have given me the option of putting myself at risk rather than the baby. Failure to consult a neurosurgeon. 
failure to treat postpartum, to recognize intracranial hemorrhage, and failure to exclude differential diagnoses. And we'll talk a little bit about each of these things. Now, who is going to get preeclampsia? Who are more likely and are at risk? People who've had it before. People who've had HELP syndrome, that's hemolysis elevated liver enzymes and low platelets. People who've had eclampsia. You can see this significantly elevates the risk. And I will tell you that somebody who has had HELP syndrome at less than 32 weeks with a prior pregnancy, you're probably looking at a 50% risk of that person getting preeclampsia again. Family history, known medical conditions that predispose to hypertension, the most common of which is renal disease. So that person in early pregnancy who presents with 2 plus proteinuria, and you say, well, this can't possibly be preeclampsia because she's only 16 weeks or she's only 14 weeks, and we all know it only happens at 20 weeks or thereafter, so we'll just ignore the 2 plus proteinuria or we'll give her some uh, antibiotics for a urinary tract infection. Be very careful, be very careful. First of all, as you'll see in a little while, a dipstick works on concentration. So you can have a negative dipstick with easily a gram of protein in the urine. And I've seen one patient with three grams of protein in a negative dipstick who was sent home before the 24-hour urine collection was returned, and she came back involuntarily uh, in this case because she was seizing and had severe preeclampsia. And there was no excuse. There's no way. You order a 24-hour urine collection and don't wait for that to come back, but send the patient home based on two negative dipsticks, which is what happened in this case. It was clear the woman had a very high urine output that diluted the amount of urine, uh, protein in her urine, and the dipstick didn't pick it up. Chronic hypertension, diabetes, multiple pregnancies, you can see that list. These are predisposing conditions. These patients should be suspected uh, of, gonna, of uh, about to be a bad actor and, and develop preeclampsia on you. Failure to anticipate preeclampsia in somebody who is developing increasing blood pressure. So don't ignore the blood pressure just because it gets under this magic guideline of 140-90. And I have seen people who will come in with a blood pressure of 145 over 95, and the nurse will dutifully put them in a room and calm them down, and the pressure will drop to 139 over 89, and now they can go home. Okay, be very careful of treating the numbers. Increasing blood pressure. A young patient with a blood pressure of 100 over 60, who now comes in with a, with a pressure of 135 over 82, should be a concern simply because it hasn't reached the critical 140-90 is not enough to say you're not getting preeclampsia. I think that because of the consequences of this condition, it is always a good idea to be aware uh, and look for signs that it is developing. You don't need hypertension to get sick. If she looks like she's got HELP syndrome, but she doesn't necessarily have very elevated pressure, you should still suspect it. 15% of people with HELP syndrome have no hypertension, and 50% of people with fatty liver of pregnancy have normal blood pressure. Whether or not fatty liver is actually a subgroup of preeclampsia is also open to debate. Know the definitions. And we really should be able to be facile with these definitions, if ever questioned. Now, forget about the questioning, forget about the legal arena, just our, our duty to the patient demands that we know what the current definitions are. And these are the terms that are being used now. There is no moderate preeclampsia. It is either mild or severe, and we need to, to use those terms appropriately. What about gestational proteinuria? Well, gestational proteinuria is not preeclampsia, but it is something that should not be ignored. And I kind of touched on this a little earlier. When you pick up that somebody in early pregnancy has got gestational proteinuria or has uh, developed new onset proteinuria, it is something that does need to be investigated. If the patient's not hypertensive and doesn't seem to have any acute uh, 
problem that requires hospitalization, it's not necessary or required to admit the patient for the workup, but a workup nevertheless they do require. And it should not be ignored or just said, oh, well, you've got urinary tract infection and it's asymptomatic and here take some macrobit. These people will need a 24-hour urine collection. I would suggest doing a creatinine clearance, renal function test, and a urine culture. I had a physician the other day call me, and he said, I've got this woman. She's only 14 weeks. She's got elevated um, blood pressure. And what do you suggest? I said, I'll do a 24-hour urine collection on her and see what's going on. He said, well, why would you do that? I mean, she's got negative dipstick. I said, well, I would just do it. And he said, oh, hold on a second. You know what? Somebody in my office did do one. Even though she's got a negative dipstick, let me look at the result. Look at the result. She's got 588 milligrams of protein in her urine. So I said, well, now you've got someone with uh, probable renal disease, underlying renal disease for her preeclampsia. But she could also have lupus nephritis. She could also have other causes for this proteinuria. It is something that we should look into and work on. So again, 24-hour urine collection, don't ignore gestational proteinuria. How do we make the diagnosis? I'm sorry if I'm insulting people by, by going over these very um, basic definitions, but um, how many people in the audience are obstetricians, deal routinely with patients? And so there are a few people that I'm, I'm not necessarily boring here. So blood pressure of greater than 140 systolic or higher than 90 diastolic. And the operative word here is or. It doesn't have to be both 140 and 90. After 20 weeks in a woman with previously normal blood pressure and they must have proteinuria. In order to make the diagnosis, ACOG states quite clearly you need a 24-hour urine or a timed urine collection. It is not sufficient just to use a dipstick if you're making the diagnosis. And in fact, if you take it to its conclusion and read that document carefully, ruling out preeclampsia requires admission of the patient to hospital, even if it's just an overnight admission to get uh, the observation, blood pressures, labs, and a 24-hour urine or a timed urine collection. And they'll accept a 12-hour timed collection. There are actually people now that have shown that a, even as little as a two-hour timed collection can be uh, very useful. So we're changing slightly, but the gold standard in this country is still the 24-hour timed urine specimen. So that's all you need to make the diagnosis. Systolic of greater than 90, uh, sorry, 140, diastolic greater than 90, one or both, plus proteinuria. Nothing to do with edema anymore. We don't worry about edema. It is irrelevant. Clearly, if somebody's got worsening edema, it's an ancillary thing you should take into account, but it is not a requirement for the diagnosis of preeclampsia. Now, severe preeclampsia is based essentially on symptoms, clinical symptoms and signs. So the diagnosis is just hypertension and proteinuria. To elevate mild preeclampsia into the realm of severe preeclampsia, you need to have one or more of a blood pressure of greater than 160 or 110 on two occasions at least six hours apart. Does that mean the person has to lie there for six hours with this massively elevated blood pressure in order to be called severe? No, it does not. But I have seen people who say that. I've had people in their own defense in a court of law say, well, you know, she only had it for five hours before she had the seizure, so we couldn't call it severe. What this is intended to do is to help in, in categorizing the, uh, the state of the disease. So somebody comes in, they have a blood pressure of 160, it settles a little bit to say 150 over 80, so they don't require uh, medication by current guidelines. And then six hours later, they have another 160, and then it drops a little bit, and it goes like that. This is severe disease. It's enough to have that. So this fluctuating pressure that's peaking above 160 systolic or 110 diastolic is enough to make it the severe disease. Okay? Or protein. So you can have somebody with a pressure of 141 over 89, 
and six grams of protein, that is sufficient to make them severe preeclampsia. Oliguria, cerebral or visual disturbances, headaches, flashes of light, areas of visual loss, pulmonary edema, cyanosis, epigastric, right upper pain, a pain, impaired liver function tests, thrombocytopenia, and here's an interesting one, growth restriction. Somebody can have 142 over 98, nothing else except a baby less than the 10th percentile, that is severe preeclampsia by definition. Correct type to t uh, way to take a blood pressure. Remember that it, uh, the cuff size is important. You've got a larger patient, you need to adjust the cuff size. Upright position in an outpatient setting. So in your office, the patient should have her blood pressure taken in an upright position after 10 or more minutes of rest. And this is taken from the working group. Uh, document. In hospital patients, the pressure should be left lateral or sitting, and you should be using the Karotkov phase five, the disappearance of the diastolic, uh, the disappearance of the sounds. And these are the other uh, criteria: no caffeine or tobacco 30 minutes before, and it is preferred to use a mercury sphygma manometer and not a Dynamap or some other device. Nobody really does that. Most people just plug the patient into the machine. But the preferred way is to actually listen. Failure to diagnose preeclampsia, the rule out preeclampsia. You need to look at the trend. Don't rely on a dipstick. We've spoken about this. If you order labs, get the results. What a basic, silly thing for me to stand here and say. And yet, how many times do you see this? Specifically in practices where there are people coming and going on and off call, and somebody's admitted at the end of somebody else's shift, they order the labs, the next person comes on, doesn't realize that, or there's not an appropriate transfer of care, and the patient has a seizure a day later, and that's when somebody looks at the labs and says, hey, but look here, she had these massively elevated liver enzymes uh, yesterday. Why, why didn't somebody do something about that? Happens all the time. So if you are, uh, and in my case, uh, as a consultant, I will call the physician and say, here's your patient, she's got whatever, uh, I would, or I have ordered these labs, I have asked for them to call you specifically to give you the results, or I want, to be, I want you to be aware that these things are cooking and that uh, she needs to have uh, them checked. And if you're in a consultant role or you're helping somebody else, uh, I would suggest you do the same thing. You don't have to necessarily uh, admit somebody unless they're complicating features. I would tell you, however, that ACOG, if that document is read, as I said earlier, very carefully, it does. In, a, in an initial diagnosis of preeclampsia, it certainly implies, if not directly states, that the patient should be ruled out in a hospital setting. Clearly, anybody complaining of a headache, even if she tells you, oh, I have migraines or I've had headaches, somebody with a diagnosis of preeclampsia who's telling you that she's got a headache, you don't give them Fioracet or Tylenol-3 or narcotics to make the headache go away. You really have to be very mindful. This is somebody now who has cerebral symptoms in a setting of preeclampsia. It is severe preeclampsia. Diagnosis made, let's move on with the appropriate management. What have you got in 2009 in a hospital, a tertiary care uh, hospital, to delay delivery in somebody at 38 weeks who has 1 plus protein, 145 over 93 and an early pressure of 100 over 60? And what do we see? We see it all the time. Go home, uh, come back in two or three days or come back next week. You don't have you know, it's not very severe, we'll just watch this. Why don't you go home and rest? Maybe you had a hard day. What do you have to gain at 38 weeks? How about this one? 138 over 89, 38 weeks, one plus protein, same thing. And yet you see this, people getting sent home in this, in this situation. Yeah, it starts getting a little bit tricky when you get down to 36 weeks with 138 over 89 and 1 plus protein. Is that somebody that we're just going to automatically deliver? 
Don't know. But maybe she's the one that you would start thinking about doing an amniocentesis. In a lot of places now, there's this whole late preterm delivery um, uh, interest going on. The NIH is going to be looking at people between 36 and 39 weeks to see whether it's worthwhile uh, delaying delivery in those patients because of the neonatal outcomes. What about 34 weeks? And the question that I say to, to people is what, ask yourself before you send somebody home or you say, now yeah, we'll just ignore this for a little longer or we'll just tolerate this for a little longer. The question is, what is the worst thing that can happen if I just send this person home? And if that thing does happen, and I look at this chart again after it's happened, am I going to feel comfortable with this decision? And if we train ourselves into that kind of thinking, I think that we're going to do the right thing more often. You know, who wants to go and admit a patient at 6 p.m. on a Friday evening when you're meant to be going out of town tomorrow morning or whatever? There's a huge temptation in our current system to say, you know what, yeah, you don't really have preeclampsia. Why don't you come back on Monday? We'll check your blood pressure then. And I think we need to be very careful of that. Ruling out preeclampsia per ACOG, this is what is required by standard of care. You need to check the platelets, liver enzymes, renal function, 12 or 24 uh, hour collection for protein. They do not go into exactly what tests you should do, but they state this is what needs to be done to rule it out. If you have a low platelet count, I would suggest checking the PT, PTT and fibrinogen. Brian Kershaw at Baylor actually showed that when, the only time you will really get abnormal coagulogram is when you've got less than 1,000, 100,000 platelets in somebody with preeclampsia. So to just knee-jerk order PT, PTT on everybody with Preeclampsia is probably not going to be cost effective. I would order an LDH. It's not a, a commonly ordered test, but in, certainly in somebody with HELP syndrome, order LDH. Why? Because a massively elevated LDH in the face of very, very low platelets is going to give you a hint that this may not be HELP syndrome and this may in fact be TTP. And it is critical to make that distinction. If you give somebody with TTP a slug of platelets before you do her C-section because her platelets are less than 50,000, you will probably kill her, if not turn her brain into a Swiss cheese. Giving platelets to somebody with TTP is almost absolutely contraindicated. It's like throwing kerosene onto a fire. In TTP, what's happening is the, is the patients are creating clots. They're making uh, antibodies to their own endothelium. And when you start throwing some more platelets in there, you're just making more clots, infarcting more organs. So how often are you going to see TTP? It's very rare. But the big kicker is the patient with incredibly low platelets, say less than 10,000, and a massively elevated LDH, greater than 10, 20,000, who has normal PT, PTT and fibrinogen. That should really concern you, really concern you about TTP. Okay, we've talked about this. I'm going to start speeding up a little bit. When am I meant to stop? Is it 4.45 or 5? 5, okay. Sorry. See people going, oh. All right, so here's a case in point. Uh, that actually occurred. A patient admitted overnight from a doctor's office with blood pressure 143.92 and 1 plus proteinuria. Put at bed rest for 18 hours. Next morning the blood pressure was 140.90. Three dipsticks negative for protein. Is this patient preeclamptic? And now you all know my secret. Because a lot of people would have said, well, she's got ne negative dipstick. Well, maybe she's just got some essential hypertension or some gestational hypertension. Why don't we just send her home? And they've started the 24-hour collection, but they don't get the result. And of course, it comes back that she's severely preeclamptic. Now, how about the management? ACOG. This is the standard that we're going to be held to. Appropriate to delay delivery in a preterm patient less than 37 weeks. Initial preeclamptic management should be in-house. Now, does that mean admitted? or just bring her into labor and delivery and do a few tests and then send her home. 
Well, obviously, ACOG speak is such that it leaves it open for interpretation. But if a bad thing happens, then you can be sure the plaintiff attorney is going to say, this means she should have been admitted to the hospital for at least 24 hours or whatever. Subsequent out -manage, uh, outpatient management is supported, and then you need to obviously have these patients getting uh, antenatal monitoring because Patients with preeclampsia are at increased risk for poor outcomes, stillbirth, abruption, etc. Twice weekly in patients with IUGR, and you can see this list here, I don't think we need to go through it too much. We should all be aware of these are the kind of things. Now, a more stringent approach, and one that I would subscribe to, is that only really delay delivery at less than 36 weeks if there's a benefit, and that benefit clearly outweighs the risk for both the mother and the baby. After 36 weeks, in most of our hospitals, the survival of babies is greater than 99%. And so what benefit can we have in somebody with preeclampsia delaying the delivery at, say, 36 and 3 sevenths? Where, what is the benefit going to be? Is there a small chance the baby will end up on a ventilator? Yes, there is. No question. That's why we, we're uh, pushing to stop people doing elective deliveries at 36 weeks. Because at less than 37 weeks, you're looking at probably 15 to 20% chance that the baby is going to end up in the ICU with some kind of respiratory uh, problem. Whether it will be intubated or not, don't know. And that really drops in the HCA data to about 8% at 39 weeks. So there's a big difference. But when you've got a sick mother who can rapidly progress and you have no way of saying how quickly she's going to progress to HELP syndrome, and she's beyond 36 weeks, I would seriously consider after an informed consent discussion with her, my advice would be that I think it's best to get you delivered. Preeclampsia less than 36 weeks, probably best managed in-house daily NST AFI, and much more often in patients with growth restriction. Now, if she's less than 36 weeks, or well, if she has preeclampsia and has growth restriction, by definition, she has severe preeclampsia, and the recommendation is after 32 to 34 weeks, deliver her. So be careful of, well, she's got a touch of IUGR and just, you know, slightly elevated blood pressures. That woman, by definition, is severe. If you are going to do outpatient management, you know, think about it carefully. Make sure the patient is aware, understands the uh, clinical symptoms and signs, and is able to take her blood pressure at home. Ultrasound, getting ultrasound for growth, pure growth at less than three weeks is probably uh, counterproductive. You're not really going to tell too much, but I would still consider weekly Doppler. And Doppler I use in patients, especially with IUGR, to monitor the progress. And we can see now by getting closer and closer to the heart in these kids, by looking at the ductus venosus, we can get information about kids that are starting to decompensate. If you are managing these patients out, uh, outpatient, repeat labs weekly, my advice is if you've really made a diagnosis of preeclampsia, that patient is best managed in a hospital. I would be, I, I would counsel you not to manage routinely patients with preeclampsia on an outpatient basis. Severe preeclampsia, ACOG is clear. Best managed in a tertiary care setting or in consultation with MFM. Labs and fetal evaluation daily basis. And they make this statement. It is reasonable to conclude that women with HELP syndrome should be delivered regardless of the gestational age. At less than 32 weeks, expectant management may be undertaken in a tertiary care facility or as part of a randomized controlled trial with appropriate IRB safeguards. It is not standard of care to uh, treat patients expectantly, the conservative aggressive approach. It is not standard of care. And it is an informed consent discussion with the patient. Now, back when they first started doing uh, expectant management, it was definitely not standard of care to do that. And most physicians, therefore, the standard of care would have just delivered patients with what, with, uh, if she'd been diagnosed with severe preeclampsia, they would have just delivered that patient 
regardless of the gestational age, say in the 90s. This day and age, with our neonatal capabilities at a tertiary care facility at beyond 24 up to, say, 30 weeks, you may want to say to the patient, here are your options. You do not have HELP syndrome. You have severe preeclampsia. We can control your blood pressure with medication. Uh, we would definitely benefit the baby by giving steroids and getting 48 hours. It is not an unreasonable thing to watch you closely, observe you for any worsening, and delay delivery until we have the steroids. And then after that, on a daily basis, we'll follow you. If your platelets hit this level, and give them some benchmarks, if your platelets drop below 100,000, if your liver enzymes get above 100, if your creatinine uh, starts to increase and is above 1, you're going to be delivered, regardless of how well you feel or etc. But set those limits and then stick to them. There's no point in setting limits and then getting to them, and the patient says, but I still feel so good. Well, okay, we'll wait a little longer. When you start pushing that, that's when the disaster happens. More stringent approach, deliver beyond 32 weeks. How many 32-week babies that have been stressed in this day and age with our neonatal intensive care capacities die from hyaline membrane disease? Very few. The survival is almost uniform now uh, at 32 weeks. I would check the labs every six to eight hours in somebody initially with 30, at 32 weeks with severe preeclampsia, continuous fetal monitoring, certainly just deliver people with HELP syndrome, aggressive control of blood pressure, and I'll show you why, anti-seizure medication. So these people should come in. They should get magnesium sulfate. That is the standard of care to prevent seizure activity and severe preeclampsia. If you're going to give them steroids, give them the steroids while they're getting the magnesium sulfate. Aggressively manage their blood pressure, less than 160, 110. I would even go better than that. I would say less than 160, 100 is probably where I would be giving people antihypertensive medication. And if you give them antihypertensive medication and they break through that, we're out of here. It's done. We're not going to start adding more antihypertensives and giving three and four drugs to keep those blood pressures below 160, 110. And we're certainly not going to tolerate prolonged 161 10s. This is why. Um, here you can see an MRI of, of somebody who, 18-year-old, uh, 35 weeks, had headaches and scotometer. And this is an MRI after delivery, uh, 32 hours after delivery. She started having eclampsia. And you can see that on just a normal uh, CT scan, you've got two areas of edema. Okay, and you cannot tell whether this is cytotoxic or vasogenic. Cytotoxic being indicative of a developing infarct and irreversible damage, and vasogenic being reversible. Until you do a diffusion weighted image, and look what happens to this area. Okay, there is unrestricted diffusion there, and that is vasogenic edema. But if you look in her occipital lobe, she has cytotoxic edema, and when she comes back, Eight weeks postpartum. I think I'm killing the battery on this thing. You can see down there. Is there another point anywhere? I think I've destroyed this one. You can see down there in that same area, just there, a permanent lesion. This woman has a permanent infarct in her occipital lobe. And here's one where it went away and there wasn't a permanent lesion. So if you do suspect uh, a problem, or you do have a patient with eclampsia and you're going to get a, a CT scan or an MRI, prefer a diffusion weighted, a DWI MRI image, and ask specifically, is the cytotoxic or vasogenic edema? It's going to uh, impact how you manage that patient. Certainly, if she's got a head full of cytotoxic edema, she is at much greater risk for an intracranial bleed and for all these complications of stroke than she is if she has vasogenic edema. There is evidence of local dysfunction of autoregulation in people with uh, preeclampsia. And this is some of the work that I did at Baylor. If you look at the central retinal artery and you look at the mean arterial pressure and the response within the artery uh, as pressure increases, you can see that in normal pregnant women, 
there is an appropriate response. There is a vasoconstriction, autoregulatory vasoconstriction as pressure increases to reduce distal perfusion. In people with preeclampsia, there is a corresponding increase to protect. There's an increase. As we start getting above amino arterial pressure of about 100, you can see that the normal person with functional autoregulation increases uh, vasoconstriction and protects. The, in this case, it's the eye. If you look at a larger vessel, same pattern. If you look at the middle cerebral artery in women with preeclampsia, you see an absence of that protection. There is failure of autoregulation in the middle cerebral artery. And these people often become pressure passive. Okay, and here you can see all women with preeclampsia, and then I separated them out into women who had no headache. And look at that. In women who have preeclamptic women with no headache, there is a normal cerebral autoregulatory response. The presence of headache and preeclampsia implies that there is disordered cerebral autoregulation, and we should be very, very careful about high or tolerating high blood pressure in women with severe headache, new onset. And this was a theory that we came up with, published a number of years ago, to try and explain uh, what happens in preeclampsia. If you are getting high blood pressure in the proximal region, what happens is that the middle cerebral artery is going to vasoconstrict normally to limit that pressure and protect the distal areas. So you have normal flow and pressure there. Now as it gets worse and the pressure gets worse and the condition goes on, you can see that the, the vessels just slowly give up the ghost. So in this case you're getting dilatation of the vessel, you're still getting normal flow, but boy, it's getting close. And then, bang, you get to a point where the disease takes over and you now have lost the ability to autoregulate and you get hypertensive encephalopathy. And that is probably the most common cause of seizure and abnormal brain blood flow in preeclampsia. It is not vasospasm. It is not abnormal vasoconstriction. It is hypertensive encephalopathy. And the management of that is very, very dependent on the systolic blood pressure, which is why we should be so mindful of the systolic blood pressure in preeclamptics. And it's only coming out now. If you look at Jim Martin's paper from a few years back, looking at women who stroked with preeclampsia, the stroke uh, episode was much, much more correlated with systolic than diastolic. So for those who say, well, I'm just waiting until the diastolic gets to 110 before I treat, be careful, be very careful. And here is at least a theory as to why we get this happening. Now, will you get vasospasm? Yes, you will, because damaged vessels go into spasm. So you can have hypertensive encephalopathy and then vasospasm on top of that. Don't ignore the warning signs of uh, headache, scotomata, signs of cerebral edema, don't ignore right upper quadrant pain. When you're getting uh, right upper quadrant pain, it's a sign of edema in the liver. It's stretching that glistens capsule. The same thing is happening in every other organ probably in the body. Preeclampsia is a systemic disorder. It's happening in the kidney, the eye, the brain. How do we prevent seizures? Essentially, in this country, it's magnesium sulfate and blood pressure control. 55 to 60 percent of these people will have at least one or more warning signs. In 20 to 30 percent, the first thing you know about is the eclampsia. The patient has a seizure. And what is important is that the magnitude of the blood pressure, pressure elevation is not correlated with the development of eclampsia. And I'm, I've got a slide here um, where I will show you that the cerebral perfusion pressure is not strongly correlated with the mean arterial pressure. Some women with the highest mean arterial pressure have completely normal cerebral perfusion pressure. They have intact functional autoregulation. And some women with borderline elevated blood pressure have the highest cerebral perfusion pressure. And these are women with very abnormal autoregulation. And that explains the patient where people go, I'm scratching my head. 
Here's this young woman having status eclampticus with severe preeclampsia, and she's got a blood pressure of 140 over 92. How can that be when next to her is a woman with 200 over 110, and she's sitting there talking to me and saying she feels fine? How does that work? Well, it works with disordered autoregulation and probably some genetic predisposition to endothelial dysfunction. How does magnesium sulfate work? Well, most of the time we don't really know. Well, up until now we don't really know. I've done some research where looking at cerebral perfusion pressure, it appears that magnesium sulfate is an effective lowering agent for cerebral perfusion pressure. It also appears that labetalol is very effective at reducing cerebral perfusion pressure. And that is why it's my first choice agent in somebody for treating hypertension and preeclampsia, labetalol. And you can give it orally too. 200 milligrams orally will work within 15 minutes in almost all patients, and it's just as effective as intravenous labetalol. And we're doing a study to, uh, to show that now. Um, what is a scientifically derived therapeutic level? Well, we don't know. Never been done. How did we get to four to seven milligrams per deciliter? Well, Jack Pritchard looked at his data and said, okay, how many people didn't have seizures and what levels did they have of magnesium sulfate? And that was the extent of the science. There was never any study done, no dose ranging, never ever a study done to determine the therapeutic level for magnesium sulfate. And so when you look at the MAGPIE study, one of the largest studies ever done, they used a dosage of four gram load and one gram per hour infusion, which has been shown by Baha Sabai uh, to have subtherapeutic levels more than 80% of the time, which is the reason why we use six gram and two gram in this country. And what did they show? They showed no difference. They showed that this infusion rate was just as effective in reducing the seizures. <clears throat> Who should we get uh, a CT or an MRI on? People with persistent seizures or people who develop seizures on magnesium sulfate? People who have any kind of focal finding, even if it's just slurring or uh, can't see quite as well through one eye. Patients who have some kind of atypical seizure where they seize just on one side of their body or have a Jacksonian type seizure. Any postpartum eclampsia, and to those people who work in an emergency room or ER docs, please, anytime a recently pregnant woman comes in with elevated blood pressure and a headache, just empirically with a knee jerk, start her on magnesium sulfate and control her blood pressure and get an OB consult. I've seen so many cases referred to me to try and defend people where women have lain around or been sent home with a prescription for antihypertensive and go see your obstetrician on Monday from an ER and sure enough they come back later that night or the next day with a brain bleed or a stroke or something like that. It is an emergency and there are cases where people are left to lie around or sit around or will put you in in a darkened room and will observe you in three or four hours, uh, that's inappropriate. A recently pregnant woman with a headache and severe hypertension is an emergency. Okay, here's the hypertension treatment. ACOG says treat diastolics greater than 105. They do not in this current ACOG technical bulletin or practice pattern, and that's the 2002 one, they do not say what systolic pressure to treat. And I spoke with Sue Raymond uh, just two or three days ago. She's the person who wrote that technical bulletin. And we agree that it's time to revise that. We need to have guidelines on systolic blood pressure to treat. And I would recommend 160. And if you're getting above 150, start thinking about treating that systolic hypertension. ACOG says hydralazine and labetalol, you know my feelings, I would go with the labetalol first. Just had a paper rejected by the uh, Green Journal looking at the effect of uh, hydralazine in one patient with severe preeclampsia where the hydralazine showed an increase in her cerebral perfusion pressure. And now we have two patients. And one of the uh, reviewers suggested that uh, uh, 
I've forgotten the words, but they weren't very nice, that you know, one leaf doesn't make a fall or something like that. So we'll get them, and I will tell you that I truly believe hydralazine is a very, very potent paralyzing agent of cerebral autoregulation. And the only reason why these people do not have more seizures when we give them hydralazine is that it paralyzes their peripheral arterial tree just as much, so it drops their, their cerebral perfusion pressure in most cases. Here you can see mean arterial pressure, just what I was talking about. Here's the velocity, but if you look at the cerebral perfusion pressure, the line is the same. You can have very, very high mean arterial pressure and normal range uh, cerebral perfusion pressure, and you can have low mean arterial pressure and very high cerebral perfusion pressure. Here's what ACOG says, hydralazine, 5 to 10 milligram doses intravenously every 15 to 20 minutes. Labetalol, 20 milligram bolus dose, and then followed by 40 milligrams, and you can go to 80 milligrams, and you can e increase it every 10 minutes or so to a maximum total dose of 220 milligrams. And if you get to that point and you haven't controlled the blood pressure, it's time to think of some other drug, usually nitroprusside. And it's probably also time, if you're not feeling comfortable, to get somebody uh, involved who is comfortable, like an intensivist, to get this woman's blood pressure down. CVA accounts for uh, 15 to 20 percent of deaths in preeclampsia and eclampsia, and as you uh, have heard today, it correlates better with the systolic than the diastolic blood pressure. Now, what do you, what do I mean when I say aggressively treat blood pressure in preeclampsia? I mean a reduction of about 20 percent in the mean arterial pressure over about 20 to 30 minutes. You do not need to drop that person's pressure from 200 over 110 to uh, you know, 130 over 60 in 10 minutes. You will kill the patient probably if you do that, and you'll certainly hurt the baby. You'll certainly divert blood away from the placenta and get a baby that has uh, decelerations and requires immediate delivery. Um, I had a patient just a few weeks ago with uh, Takayasu's, and of course she showed up at 14 weeks pregnancy without ever having consulted anybody about getting pregnant, She's got severe renal artery stenosis and had pressures of 220 over 180 and walked in smiling and looking around and uh, you know, clearly this is somebody that had to be managed. She had seen her uh, doctor and been sent home to come back and see me the next week, 220 over 180. Okay, that is an emergency. She should be in a hospital. I immediately put her in the ICU and over five days we've got her pressure down now on four drugs, mind you, four drugs, to 130 over 60. And they're too scared to go in and re-stent her renal arteries, which is what's going to have to be done. But now she's pregnant and so we're trying to manage her with multiple antihypertensive agents. But when you see people with these very elevated pressures, anything over 160, 110, please just admit them and get them controlled. And we're nearly done, I promise. And here are Jim Martin's data looking at uh, BP comparisons baseline and before stroke. And you can see the baseline at the beginning of the pregnancy, 110 systolic, just before they had the stroke, 175. And the diastolics were not that much, I mean, none of them were really higher than 110. The pre-stroke systolic pressures were more, uh, much more predictive of who was going to have a stroke. And finally, differential diagnosis of preeclampsia. Whenever you see someone with severe preeclampsia or HELP syndrome or something that just doesn't fit, think of these things. TTPHUS, we've spoken a little bit about that. Remember, the important reason to differentiate these cases is because the treatment is completely different. You do not have to deliver somebody with TTP immediately. You do not have to sacrifice a baby at 25 weeks if the patient has TTP. You've got to do plasmapheresis. You've got to start on high-dose steroids. You've got to manage your TTP. You don't have to deliver the baby and sacrifice it, whereas somebody with that degree of disease and HELP syndrome at 23 or 24 weeks does have to be delivered. You don't really have the choice. You also don't want to give platelets, as we've mentioned. Sorry. <laughs>
the peripheral smear. Remember the three major components that you have to have to make a diagnosis of TTP are hemolytic anemia, thrombocytopenic uh, purpura, or very low platelets, and some cerebral manifestation, which may be as little as a headache. Fatty liver of pregnancy, oh, I'm going crazy here. Fatty liver of pregnancy, pheochromocytoma, lupus nephritis or cerebritis, herpes hepatitis, I've seen one case, and there have been three cases in England reported of uh, West African immigrants with severe folate deficiency who actually presented looking like HELP syndrome and had their babies delivered, two of which died. And then they found out that what they actually had was severe folic acid deficiency. Major complications are all of these things. Pharyngeal edema, I've seen this once, and that was a woman who was extubated after uh, being ventilated for a few days with severe preeclampsia, and they just pulled the tube out, and then it was too late because she had massive uh, laryngeal edema and her airway was lost. And the only way uh, that we got her back was with a blind nasal intubation, just shoving a tube in and hoping for the best, and finally we did get it into the right place. Informed consent we've spoken about. I think it's important to make sure that the mother understands that she is assuming the risk to allow her baby more time to develop. Strict criteria, we've spoken about setting those thresholds and keeping them. Making sure that everybody in the family understands. Making sure she understands not a guarantee of success and that she can change the plan at any time and document that discussion with a dictated note. Neurosurgical consult. It's like voting in Louisiana, they tell me, early and often. Any unusual presentation, any evidence of an intracranial bleed, treat the mother first. The baby is secondary. Monitor the fetus during neurosurgical procedures. And I think we're almost done. There we are. We are done. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm sorry it's so late. And if there are any questions, I'm happy to take them. Only question is, can we go now? Oh, there's a question. Okay, there's a question, yeah. Uh, the systolic di diastolic ratio in the, in the cord. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know that basically when you're looking at that, you're getting an, an indication of how the fetus is responding to utero-placental resistance. And uh, forward flow is going to be systolic, and uh, flow during diastole is going to be an indicator of the pressure back. So when you get an increasing ratio, it's an indicator. It is um, only really, really useful when there's no diastolic flow or reverse diastolic flow. And in a case of growth-restricted fetuses uh, with reversal of diastolic flow, you usually do not have much longer than 72 to 96 hours of survival. So if you see that, that baby is probably best delivered. Yeah, so I, I, I certainly, we couldn't talk about everything, but antenatal monitoring and Doppler in the face of severe IUGR is very useful. Question there. Yeah, that's a very good question. We just wrote a, a, an editorial in, uh, in, an, in an, a British journal uh, about that, and they do use it. But in this, the United States, it's still not uh, fully accepted. And in fact, the data are still suggestive that, uh, are still saying that you should use a timed specimen as opposed to just a spot uh, protein creatinine ratio in preeclampsia. So at this point, it's not standard of care. It certainly needs more study. Any other questions? Oh, sorry. I've got a light in my eye. I'm not. How remote? Hmm. Uh, it's a good case. <laughs> well, it's a challenging case, and I think that that is exactly the kind of case that 
we, we would use our antenatal monitoring. Now, when you say mild preeclampsia, uh, as long as she is within the, the true characteristics. Now, if that baby that you're telling me is less than uh, the smaller baby, if there's a big growth discordancy, and that baby is less than the 10th percentile, ooh, then I'm going to say this is not mild preeclampsia anymore. Uh, I'm certainly going to admit that patient. I'm certainly going to give her steroids. At 26 weeks, I'm going to offer her expectant management. It will depend on the smaller baby, on the baby that is not tolerating the pregnancy. And I would set limits. I'd say, well, we're going to measure growth over the next two weeks if you stay that way. We're going to measure your labs. We're going to watch and see whether your pressures are getting worse or whether you're settling down. And we're going to keep you at bed rest, keep you in the hospital, and closely monitor the situation. As long as you understand this little baby could die at any time. And it's your right to say, I don't want to take that chance. I want to be delivered. And these are dichorionic or monochorionic twins? Dichorionic twins. Well, again, uh, over how many weeks? Are we looking at a 28-weeker now or are we looking at a 32-weeker? 28 weeks. So you're going to look at that 28-weeker and say, are we at a point where it's going to be safe to deliver the other baby? And, you know, most kids at 28 weeks are going to do pretty well in an ICU. I would prefer to see them get to 30 weeks. So now you say, well, I would say, mm, 28 weeks, if this little one may not be growing, but is still having a reactive non-stress test, still has adequate fluid, doesn't have reversal of the, the diastolic flow, uh, I'm going to sit on her, but I'm going to make sure the mama understands, and I'm going to watch that little baby very closely. And if we get reverse diastolic flow, I'm going to deliver. But I'm going to push this pregnancy as long as mom remains stable, despite the fact the little one may not be growing, as long as the bigger one is getting a better and better chance, and the little one is not showing signs of acute decompensation, I would push that out a little bit until 32 weeks. At 32 weeks, I'm going to say, all bets are off. I think it's best to deliver both now. You've got a lot of good questions. Rescue steroids just been presented at, uh, at SMFM. You may have been there. There are data now to suggest that under 34 weeks, if you've given the uh, steroids more than six weeks before the first course, that a single rescue dose may be of benefit. It is not standard of care. I think I would. I think I would. But it's definitely not standard of care. Again, it's going to be an informed consent dis uh, uh, discussion. My pleasure. Thank you.